Hello and welcome to the Royal Aeronautical Society and Proto Labs webinar, Aerospace Manufacturing in 2023, the big issues. Uh, I am Tim Robinson, Editor-in-Chief of Aerospace Magazine and your moderator today for of an expert panel we've assembled to really get an insight into advanced manufacturing and aerospace. Earlier this year, we saw a landmark survey of over 1,800 RES members uh, asking their opinions on the state of aerospace manufacturing, innovation and the challenges ahead. Uh, that was published in Aerospace Magazine and on, also on the Aero Society blog. I'm delighted uh, to welcome three top experts on the panel today. Uh, first off, we have uh, Tassos uh, Pantaleris, European project engineer from digital design and manufacturing spe specialist Protolabs. His journey started as application engineer, uh, offering high level technical support and advisories when clients are searching for design and manufacturing solutions. Uh, during this time, uh, Tassos became a Protolabs additive manufacturing champion making a go-to representative for process and capability advice. Uh, welcome, Tassos. Hello, Tim. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we also have Colin Mitchell, Head of Future Industrial S uh, Systems at Airbus UK. Uh, he boasts more than four decades of experience in aerospace manufacturing. Currently, he serves as Head of Future Industrial Systems at Airbus, holding specific responsibility for ensuring optimised aircraft product architectures, industrial systems, and related manufacturing technologies for future programs. Uh, welcome, Colin. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much. Uh, we also have Alex Hickson, Head of Technology Structures, Manufacturing and Materials from the ATI, Aerospace Technology Institute. Uh, he's responsible for the ATI's work on aerostructures of the future, uh, one of the key themes identities in the Institute's technology strategy, which includes innovative manufacturing methods and technologies as well as new materials. Uh, previously at GKN Aerospace, Alex also has experience from sectors sort of aut automotive, motorsport and space. Uh, welcome, Alex. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good to be here. Right, so the format for this is, I'm going to now turn it over to Tassos, who's going to give us uh, 10 minutes of the uh, the results of the survey, a bit of in insight into what we found from the, from this, this survey. Uh, on the aerospace manufacturing, and, and, uh, and then we're going to turn it over to uh, Q&As. So I, just a reminder, please do uh, put your messages in the chat and we'll, we'll, we'll come, come, to those, to, come to those questions as we go through it. We've got about sort of uh, an hour uh, to go all told, uh, but yeah, yeah, please do. Um, it's an interactive session. Please uh, put your questions. Right, over to you, Tassos. Perfect. Thank you very much, Tim. So let's start with the findings. Um, so basically, this survey, what what we um, have from this survey now that you can see on uh, the screen. And basically, Tim, I think we could start directly from um, the second slide where we have all the um, um, the juicy information. So basically, we um, selected the key points here in order to. Uh, to use them for food for discussion and as a basis for um, uh, our discussion today. And basically, um, they could be used as uh, a source of um, new questions and um, comments uh, about uh, some specific areas. Of course, you are most welcome to um, to provide us with some um, further questions after we uh, review this um, this slide, and we could start with. Um, the main focus areas for the uh, aerospace industry. So basically, this is a very good percentage, a, a very good uh, reply uh, from uh, just about 2,000 um, uh, members. So basically, one of uh, the key areas uh, that needs to be um, looked at a bit uh, more in depth uh, and more seriously uh, by the industry would be um, the skilled personnel. So basically, this is something that, um, of course, the aerospace industry requires um, a high level of uh, engineers, uh, requires high level of uh, applications, certifications, and any sort of um, um, standards. Uh, and of course, there is a need uh, in combination with the um, the increase in interest and the increase of use of usage of 3D printing to make sure that um, the right people um, get the right uh, positions in order, of course, to uh, to facilitate uh, the growth of additive manufacturing. Uh, so this 
um, the, the skilled personnel um, approach or point, if you like, uh, was on quite high percentage. Of course, um, the rest as sustainability and the supply chain uh, shortages are uh, as well the, the key uh, points here, which will help um, um, the additive manufacturer to uh, to be developed further uh, within the in, uh, aerospace. And on our discussion, we could <clears throat> give some examples as well of how the industry currently reacts or, or uh, what's the trends as well, so we could have a, a, an idea of what these uh, basically mean. Another interesting point is the, the actual manufacturing um, technologies and processes that uh, being used, and um, these highlighted a quite high percentage of uh, an established, uh, established uh, process like the CNC machining, uh, along of course with uh, 3D printing. And this is quite interesting because um, it just in a way highlights that, of course, since the um, additive manufacturing can offer uh, very big advantages and it's really getting to a mature level, but we shouldn't, of course, uh, forget the, um, the established processes and the established um, certifications and standards that we've uh, been using for uh, many years. And these are, this could be a point where um, when we would like to go further in the uh, in this industry, uh, it could uh, create a bit of a uh, clash, if you like. So we would really need to be very careful on um, how we would use added manufacturing, um, making sure that we don't really um, mislead um, uh, the the industry itself, uh, as well as creating false expectations. Another key area, of course, is the uh, the robotics manufacturing and injection molding. Um, these are, of course, um, ongoing processes. These processes really um, being used currently. Uh, there are certain systems, there are certain procurement, certain um, supply chain um, uh, constructions already been in place. So, of course, the added manufacturing would be really good uh, to see how it could fit how it could further be developed and how it will influence further um, the entire industry. Also, moving forward, interesting point would be uh, the amount of manufacturing which is being done in-house. Uh, there are different percentages, uh, of course, because uh, it's uh, the actual uh, aerospace manufacturer who um, use, utilize uh, their own equipment. The, um, and other industries, for example, who uh, which utilize digital manufacturers, but of course, it is very important to see, and of course, we will see it uh, through our discussion how these systems are set up, because in uh, aerospace we know that the investments uh, and the um, uh, and the values are really really high, so some companies cannot wouldn't really be able to to cope with the extra investments the continuous and significant investments over the years in order to adapt uh, to add the manufacturing and we can see of course ways to to overcome that and to of course make sure that we um uh, we give the right or we highlight the right direction um and basically the other things that we um we can see quickly the certification and standards this is i would say one of the the biggest highlights uh, that needs to be um, discussed uh, and of how it will be overcome but at the same time how we could get things moving of course there are processes um, in place by different um, certification bodies and companies but of course in order to to get it really established and in an area that we uh, the industry will uh, embrace, uh, we still have uh, quite a long way to go. The um, the challenges, of course, of the adoption of uh, digital manufacturing are um, the, the lack of expertise. Of course, it is quite a new process comparing to uh, the rest, of course, and this would require certain um, education, certain skills, certain expertise um, through the actual process through 
other sources like design through other approaches through um, the companies themselves or the universities as well. So they are really uh, and really important for um, for the future um, of uh, the industry. The project course, of course, and the and the networks um, security. That's really good. Uh, these are really good points, especially now with um, the artificial intelligence, especially now with um, a lot of software that is being involved and a lot of platforms or digital platforms that are created or are to be created. So these are really, really nice um, uh, areas to to look uh, at and not um, oversee. And let's not forget also uh, the actual design, the design intent, the design approach. We need to uh, to look for additive manufacturing because it's not only uh, the equipment itself, it's not only the trend itself, it's uh, basically how to uh, get into this uh, design adoption uh, and the new design for manufacturability in order to um, utilize and unlock the full potential of um, um, this process. So basically, I would say that these are, um, in short, uh, the things that uh, were highlighted into the survey and there are really fairly uh, good points which will drive our discussion today also. Brilliant. OK, well, thank you very much for uh, Tassos for that, uh, that overview of the survey and bringing us uh, right up to date. So we're now going to have uh, about sort of 45 minutes of uh, Q&A. Uh, please do put your questions in the chat box. We'll, we'll be interspersing with there and coming back uh, to various questions. So I'm going to take moderator's uh, chairman's privilege and ask the first question and just just throw this open to the, the whole panel. Um, do we agree with the survey's findings? Um, any any surprises? Um, Colin, Alex, uh, what about you guys? Do, do, you, do, you, do you broadly agree with what was uh, what came out there? So when I when I first read it, I thought how uh, perceptive it was of of sort of my feelings of what was going on in the industry it certainly brought out some some real key points which we think are you know from from as an oem the are the key priorities at the moment um so yeah really really interesting really interesting outcome i think the thing for us to understand now is how we how we tackle some of those some of those challenges going forward yeah i, I was uh i was in agreement um the challenges that people are seeing um quality in aerospace is is always number one because it's inherently linked to um safety but also delivery as these organizations the oems are looking to um ramp up manufacturing from the i know back to pre-covid levels and and upwards um progressively because it's clearly putting you know some tension in the um supply chain um so yeah absolutely i i guess i found it interesting that um cost had slipped um uh to appear to be quite low um i'd be interesting if um the oem's procurement departments felt the same way <laughs> <laughs> i imagine that might be uh might be different i i think it's just that the things that are enabling rate um and delivery is is the focus of the supply chain um i don't think cost has has gone off the radar it's just in order to meet those um that's where probably the priorities are as maybe an interpretation of some of the results do you think that's changed now do you think cost would, should, would be higher now if we, we ran the survey uh, today uh, not not necessarily. I think that the, the, the cost challenges keep coming, obviously, from from the OEMs into the supply chain and, and they endeavour to to meet those. Some of them um, obviously addressing them with technology, with you know, business improving activities, but um, it, it's the demands to meet the um, rate, which is really, you know, the, the, the major um, push for them and and having an you know, robust supply chains, which, you know, clearly having challenges at the moment because it's global supply chains not not just the you know the UK footprint which is uh, clearly under pressure to to meet the demands of uh, uh, of rate okay just to compliment sorry just to compliment what Alex is saying they of course cost is always really important um, but we will always trade we'll always trade cost against the ability to to ramp up or meet rate or 
um, you know, bringing bring in new products, new technologies, or against weight weight or aircraft performance targets. So um, I think we're we're in a position now where performance of product is becoming quite important with where we're going with sustainability in flight. Um, so aircraft performance is going to be quite key. So I think we will see a slight change in the relative value of cost versus versus aircraft performance in the in the coming years. And okay, uh, so we've got a first comment uh, struck question from uh, from the floor. Recruitment as a goal is important, but prior to recruitment is training. Uh, so we did have uh, skills, and obviously uh, there uh, mentioned decent training takes years. Investment is fundamental to the whole process. Get the impression it doesn't get the sufficient focus. You have to walk before you can run. Uh, thoughts on that uh, that uh, comment struck question? Um, well, I would say that that train training with a diverse workforce as well because we're really struggling to get diversity into into our organization um there's not the female community are not coming through with the with the right level of skills um i think so that's a real gap in the early years stuff we were doing stuff some years ago weren't we where we were trying to develop develop engineering capability in at primary and secondary level that seems to be dropping away but yeah i think getting the right people in um, we've got quite a lot of uh, direct entry graduates come in this year with really good skills. They've done placements in companies, so that's a really positive way to go out and get some additional training with, with their academic work. So I think that side of it is quite promising, but they're kind of classic engineers. You know, they're, they're young male um, guys, so I think we're lacking a bit in the diversity area. But really key uh, training is obviously going to be really key. Right, so getting that message out, yeah. I know that the um, the Aerospace Growth Partnership has a skills group which you know picks up um, the kind of future skills that are required because uh, you know, clearly there's a lot of technology in, in development and it's about creating um, the skills that um, the sector will need. Um, part of that is not just what's happening in you know universities uh, rtos the like but as, as um colin was saying it's down through to you know schools and the academies and it's partly it's educating them and how the syllabus and that changes as well because some of the topics of what's really important in business are not subjects that they're studying in schools but um or, or skills necessarily because it's not just the um the technical skills it's some of the um the, the the skills in terms of um you know leadership and teamwork um other factors which businesses need to operate effectively as well so uh, i think it's bringing that that community along as well that they're getting the right skills the right environment that's bringing out the kind of skills that the sector needed things as well like projects like former student at universities are raising to design and build race cars from scratch there's similar activities in, in aerospace where they actually get hands-on design yeah. experience because it's not just the theory, it's the practical as well, which is really key to um, turning ideas into you know, product systems, testing them and proving them to work against a set of requirements, which uh, you, know, you, you need ideally taking into um, businesses rather than training them on the job when they join. Indeed, right. Uh, so I've got a question for, for uh, both Colin and Alex. What, what are the what are the challenges for uh, we've, certification? Was obviously mentioned as one of the survey uh, topics. What are the challenges for certification of the materials and the AM progress uh, process from both the Airbus and the ATI point of view? Uh, so shall I go first? So from our point of view, so it's. Um, it, Everyone in aerospace is really interested with the AM, AM technology. You know, we can pretty much unlock the the challenge of making something manufacturable from a classic um, way. To, so you can almost have completely unconstrained design. I think the challenge of then taking that unconstrained design through to a certified product is where we've got the difficulties and why it feels like it's taking quite a long time. So back from the you know back from the powders we use, whether those are um, metallic or non-metallic, the management of that, the the, the uh, almost clean room environment management of those materials, the build process right through the build process, the uh, 
the, the thermal um, stress uh, related aspects for um, stress relieving the part and the build, the build orientation are all things that need to be managed properly. And I don't think today we've got the right sort of regulation and, and process management throughout the throughout the um, uh, the development of the materials and the process that will enable us to just go off and make these parts very easy to go and buy a machine and make almost anything you like these days but managing that and making sure that the uh, the end user is getting what they actually um, set out to to get is, is something that's still still a real challenge Alex yeah, I, I completely agree with the points you made. Um, uh, when I started at GKN Aerospace, um, it's when they just um, started out on their journey with with AEM, and we've seen the you know a decade or more of investment that's happened within that organisation. Um, you know, the team's grown uh, substantially because it is you know a very technically demanding area that is linked up with academia, the RTOs. The equipment providers um, and and the OEMs to to help develop this technology is hugely complex. Um, there are uh, can you can you design and, and make things today that are lighter weight and use less material um, that will improve the aircraft? Absolutely, it's about achieving the quality requirements. Um, one of the things that we've we've looked at uh, is recognizing. There are a number of barriers to entry, and so um, we've worked to set up an additive manufacturing community of practice that actually has the OEMs, the tier ones, um, equipment providers, standards bodies, and this is not just civil defence as well, because recognising that they're going on this journey together to share best practice, and this, you know, agree what the barriers and the steps forwards are to going and address this to get the technology flying, because unless sector works together um, uh, aligned on the same goals and right priorities and the stepping stone to go and do this to put the standards in place bring the certification bodies on the journey as well um, we, we're not going to realize the ambition uh, and we want to accelerate that and make it happen sooner so uh, I think we recognize as a sector the challenges there and bringing those experts together will enable us to to move on the path, right path and in the quickest way possible so we've got an, an, another another question here from the floor for all three of you. Uh, the survey highlights qualification certification as a key challenge as a big contributor to part cost. Ensuring the qual cert approach is tailored, proportionate to part criticality seems like a key consideration. Any thoughts how we can better achieve this? So I suppose that's a, a question of uh, is this part a structural, structurally critical or is it something that you'd, you'd really don't, you know, it's kind of a plastic part, it's maybe in the, the cabin, don't really need to kind of worry too much about that. Uh, any thoughts on the, on that from the from the panel? Yeah, I could um, start with that. Uh, yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Colin. So basically, this this is a good point because, of course, uh, uh, and plenty of parts exist with different st structural and mechanical properties, thermal properties, um, plastic metals, and so on. Um, so basically. Currently, um, and some companies, you, there should be um, a quality um, department uh, which could um, have a look at this, check this, certify this, uh, approve or not. An idea on this one that it starts to um, uh, to take um, shape slowly. Of course, no idea how far it could go, but as an idea, it could be just to use a digital, let's say, uh, like a digital platform uh, where um, there will be a collaboration of the uh, certification bodies, the the material manufacturers, the the, the printer manufacturers, um, where we would have um, approved states of the actual material or the parts, uh, for example, and let's say Airbus could come and say, I want this part, this material to withstand these forces, for example, and um, I would like a certified option or solution for that. So it could be uh, rather than just spending a lot of uh, time, uh, adding a lot of cost um, within the company, there could be some 
certified bodies um, in the AM where they could provide a solution for the application, which of course would be certified and quality approved without um, doing for uh, doing that on every single um, part every time. So this could be like a digital platform or library um, where everyone um, from the um, aerospace companies industry could have access to and could build up a good portfolio and approved status. Uh, Colin, you're saying? Colin or Alex, have you any thoughts on that? Yeah, for, I mean, from an from an o, uh, OEM point of view, yeah, I mean, of course, if we use if we do cabin parts, um, then there's not as much criticality. They're, li they're likely more likely to be in a non-metallic environment where we where we get we'd get the most benefit in terms of product performances is in high load titanium parts. If we can, you know, stop making those out of, out of forgings and and billets of material and make those, you know, more structurally appropriate using the AM the AM process, then that's re where we really want where we really want to use it but then the criticality of the performance of that process is is going to be fundamental today today we're doing um part part qualification part testing for every part we manufacture and we have to get away from that and then try and get to ultimately a a process um cert, a, you know a certified process not a certified part because uh, the cost that would help us with all, all the cost aspects producing test pieces and even cut, cutting up parts um is not is not really appropriate for a high certainly a high volume market um am we use it in many different areas we use it in the r t environment but just making making um parts we can use in a demonstration piece um you know right right up to we 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 are trying to put put these parts on onto the product because we believe there is a future for the for the technology uh, alex said any any thoughts on this or yeah, I mean, a, a tailored approach, you know, it seems quite um, possible with key things that comes back down to, again, the repeatability of the equipment, the process, the materials. It's it's having the data that gives the OEMs the confidence to design it into their products. Um, you know, at, at the moment, they they have the confidence in the established technologies which are, um, you know, flying as, as the large structural components today. Uh, and it's building up that that data set, um, uh, and that that comes through, you know, having repeats of manufacture of a number of pieces of equipment, but also being able to do that at the right price point from the point of view of the materials um, and the end component costs. So there's quite a bit of work going on to also work to see how that can be um, uh, reduced. So um, it's a big outlay to to do that materials qualification piece. So it's about it's about selecting those right components, and they'll end up probably as, as uh, Colin says, focusing on where the biggest wins are. Um, so uh, whilst you can be putting it into the aircraft, the cost of the qualification, it, it's you know it's likely to be where the biggest advan uh, advantage is in terms of you know weight saving, performance increase of the aircraft. Um, you know, if it reduces the fuel burn the emissions, then um, that's probably where the focus will be in the at least in the sh in the short term until the technology is proven, and then a lot more opportunities open up for using it across more of the aircraft. Okay. Um, next question is uh, so my, my uh, playing devil's advocate a little bit. I, I will I would say well. Um, uh, uh, 3D printing, additive manufacturing, hypover substance. Uh, so I've been re writing about this for about 20 years now since I since I first joined, uh, and it's uh, um, you know been writing. It seems to be still be niche parts and rapid prototyping, uh, and we've we've already sort of like touched on some of the problems: cost, certification. Um, what, how do we? Where do we see it now? Is it is it gone mainstream? And, and what are the existing barriers? What do we think are the, the remaining barriers? Is it you know is it standards, business case? hidden costs there perhaps um do you want me to yeah go for, it. <laughs> go for it yeah, so I'll, I'll go for it i'll go for it i mean i've yeah i'm 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 similar to you tim it's been around a long long time from the original stereosoc parts to um 
right up through i think i think because the the uh process is developing so fast you can you can buy a machine one year the next year is almost obsolete so the equipment's almost obsolete because it's still moving at such a rate and i think that's that's part of the problem it's not really it's not really stabilized on a particular element of the of the technology development um but I, I still think it's going to get there and it's something that will be a tremendous opportunity in the future in terms of shortening the product, you know, the, the, the overall new product cycle. Because uh, if we can go from design part to, to manufactured part very quickly, which we can do in theory with AM, um, it's something we, we need to crack. To crack it, we've got to sort out all this quality, repeatability standards and certification. Um, we need some real focus on that and the ATI are doing some good work with these sort of working groups which they have us a part of so we think that's a, that's a good opportunity on the way forward. I that's would also comment there, yeah? yeah I would yeah. Uh, comment also and further um, agree with Colin's points it would be that the hidden costs would be um, the post processing of the parts after they are finished, because it's not only to print them, not, not only to design them, to print them perfectly fine, but it's the actual um, labor that would be required to get the full part. And of course, and or further processes, like for example, if we use a, a metal part, we have the full complexity, we have everything, but we could post machine it in order to achieve tighter tolerances on certain areas, for example, in order to uh, to be able to to be mounted somewhere in the best possible way, for example. So this could be um, an area that we um, should um, focus also on. And of course, the repeatability, as we uh, mentioned already, uh, both Alex and Colin. And this could be something that if we had to, to get a bit more into this um, in order to achieve repeatability, maybe through a um, a common platform, um, the parameters of how it was, the part was made, was printed, could be used as um, as a certification in a way, as per se, in order to to start believing a bit more and getting a better results um, after manufacturing. So I believe overall repeatability and uh, post uh, handling handle the parts after they are made could be a key in this area, both on cost and on time savings. Okay. Alex, anything to add, add on this? Yeah, sure. So, um, <clears throat> uh, things you mentioned again, standards is a key one that needs to be developed. So, working with some of the standards bodies. Um, uh, around this, um, certainly, uh, and NASA presented on it as this is a topic at the MTC, about a good three, uh, three, four years ago, where the standards didn't exist for them, but they were adamant they needed to get um, AM on their future missions. Um, so they developed the standards themselves, um, and we can learn from other sectors. So working with them, I think, is quite key around what they've uh, they've been doing. Um, additive manufacturing is in production in other sectors and not just in sort of niche applications in um, uh, space and motorsport um, you know uh, in, in obviously medical and other areas and um, it is in production in aerospace for things like temporary fasteners because they don't fly on the aircraft they can be um, uh, cost effectively um, made at volume so there's a level of robustness within in proof of those um processes but there's also work to get the business case working so the speed of the build is quite key um so thickness of layers number of um lasers if you're using a, a laser machine um the cost of the machines getting them up uh, addressing the the properties through um how they process the the, the material in process monitoring control to and you know, i know that you've built the part right to um, reduce and hopefully in time eliminate the post-process inspection, which again is time consuming, costly. Um, yeah, these are these are kind of key things, but the post-processing is, is a key element, um, not just in terms of the non-destructive testing lights, but the powder removal, 
removal of support structures, um, achieving the surface finish, even even designing for how you're going to finish the part afterwards, um, you know, it, to, to withstand the machining loads if you've got surface finishes. There's a lot to consider. Um, and and so it's it's working out where the areas that it makes the most sense to get it working. Um, so for powder bed, some of the complex parts, things like heat exchangers um, are a real, real advantage. And, and this is you know, matured and running in other in other sectors such as motorsport. Um, and aerospace is benefiting from the people that have been developing the things there and direct any de deposition for the larger structures um, to replace forgings, um, you know, to, to remove the amount of material that, that goes into the part that reduces not just the material utilization and energy and emissions associated with it, but also the finishing time. So it's, it's focusing in certain areas where it has the biggest um, impact. Okay. So obviously, uh, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, one of the, one of the, the big benefits there is you're only using the material you need. So there's big benefits there in terms of uh, sort of uh, waste uh, and uh, recycling and sustainability. So next question is, please elaborate on the survey issue of sustainability. What does that mean? Is there weakness in understanding achieving standards or perhaps about the circularity of manufacturing? Uh, so that leads on to uh, one, of, one of the questions I had is, are we seeing the... Are we seeing that the the uh, the promises that 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 has been you know is being put forward for 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 additive manufacturing of yes you can you can make these sort of savings in terms of the material I suppose uh, any any thoughts on on sustainability? Um, so from material utilization, I mean if you if you take some areas like the powder, uh, powder bed, um, so you actually you potentially potentially using quite a bit of material actually in a, in a powder bed build because that needs some requalification and some work to get that unused material back to a standard where you can where you can reuse that with, within that process so the uh the direct deposition processes are of interest but then you can't get to the as near net shape or form as, as as perhaps you might like I think the and then the other thing you've got is the material prices at the moment are way above you know are way above um, what we've got with any sort of raw materials um, that we used to do. So there's some real challenge. I think it's heading. It really is heading in the right direction. Um, in Airbus, we're doing with all our materials utilization because obviously it's part of the cost. We're trying to get the best fight to fly um, ratio. Um, so we're always interested in those technologies where we where we get a much better uh, or or we can limit the wastage of of that material. Uh, and then if we are you know utilizing more material than we actually fly, then we're looking to to recycle that appropriately back in into the industry if we can. Anyone else? Yeah, I sustainability. Would add to that. Yeah. To uh, Colin's comment would be, of course, for the material perspectives, we see that, of course, um, um, very big players, material uh, established companies, get into um, added manufacturing. So uh, there is plenty. There are plenty of options, uh, and therefore uh, the price could be uh, going uh, downwards. Uh, so it it is something that we uh, should be able to. Um, um, to improve in the next coming years, for sure. But the material handling, the material options, and the material handling in the actual printing process uh, is definitely um, a key point here. So basically, the powder bed fusion, yeah, we, we need to, um, uh, although it is, um, there are really already very big advantages, we need to make sure that the actual material um uh, gets um, um the smallest possible we can we can utilize it in the small uh, smallest possible um quantity and the reusability of it of course would play a vital role on the cost savings and sustainability itself so maybe i'll add to that is that um when am is a, a near net shape process um the, the ATI did a, a near net shape insight paper that kind of looked at all the different processes one of the things that we recognized and we've set up um one of our advisory groups for the um cross-cutting theme was 
around what's the embedded energy and emissions with different material processing routes um, so that uh, you can understand it and, and see then also how that might then influence potential design decisions. Um, so how does AM compare against say a casting process or a forging process? Uh, one of the key things there is um, there aren't standards for how you um, quantify those things. Um, so we've been getting the knowledge shared from um, different people across the sector, including sort of an academia and RTOs as, as well as um, uh, manufacturing folk around how they do this and some case studies to 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 look at this um because the lights of airbus are, are looking at this part of the trade studies of how of, of the different methods um to, to see how they compare as um potentially like carbon accounting will potentially will, will become a, a factor of how things are, are done in the future so um minimizing the embedded energy emissions associated with um, materials from raw material through to end product is key and that includes the robustness of the process so you make rights first time and reduce scrap um, as well as looking at all of the um, uh, the processes uh, to, to making a part so um, it, that that is important it's also how you deal with um, uh, the material that you're recycling but also the the part at end of life um, so the process of melting it down and, and reclaiming it and how do you um, effectively like clean that material so there's technologies associated with that so that you can take the material then back into the process it means you're also less reliant on importing material because uh, we've we've then got a, a level of material that we can potentially put through but it's about the quality requirements of that material understanding that um, because at the moment it's obviously using a lot of primary material and other sectors are are working on how they use secondary material so it, it is a key consideration with the aerospace sector of how you get those performance requirements um, uh, and, and how you minimize material utilization as well as looking to, to see how you can potentially recycle material through uh, that comes out at the end Okay, uh, so I've got another question here. Is um, last week we had the obviously the AI summit uh, and uh, big big kind of global thing on on AI. Obviously a hot topic at the moment. How do we see uh, AI affecting manufacturing, e.g., e optimizing three D design and and uh, uh, particularly I suppose in additive manufacturing? Uh, how much human input is still needed, and, and are we there yet where you can you can you can turn to chat GPT and say, uh, design me a bracket for an A350 and leave it to it. Shall I go first? Sure. I think there's there's definitely going to be opportunities where we can where we can use these systems to enhance the the um, the way we build our aircraft. I think where you need to start is with all the design rules going into that to enable it to make the right decisions. So you'll still need that element initially. But I do I do believe there's a great opportunity to do a you know do a big project on on seeing what what the power could be to design a design a product very quickly with uh, once once you feed some basic rules in um I think that'd be a really a really good thing to explore a definite capability there it, it, it's fair to say that people are utilizing the technology currently there are some tools that are available that utilize um uh, elements of machine learning and, and AI, um, particularly for um, path optimization, for looking at the, the heat flow into the material or printing a part to, to achieve the best material properties surface finish. Um, so it's an evolving space. Uh, I'm sure it will become um, you know, more uh, readily developed and adopted um because of its potential impact. The, the complexity of the things that are being dealt with is such that um they, these are absolutely the right kind of tools to um to use and then the development and acceleration will probably happen far far faster using these tools so uh it, it is something that we're aware of and we want to see well what what can we pull from outside of the uk and then what should we be developing inside the uk and that's a key thing it's um it's getting that insight from the sector and those are outside of the sector that utilizing the tools that um you know the OEMs and and the ATI benefit from to see where where should we be focusing our our efforts for the best impact for the sector and for the UK. 
that's also uh, how about you are, are you uh, is proto labs looking at ai are you using it already basically i would say that um i would comment basically on the fact that um ai should be looked at in in, in this sector should be looked at as a um, um as a chain meaning that it could be used from um for the the part design itself uh, in order to, to utilize uh, better shapes, uh, net shapes, uh, and of course move to the production and the quality point of view, meaning that from the production um, it could be utilized in order to, um, to identify any um, um, fail builds, for example, to identify better uh, and better approaches to an existing uh, um, uh, geometry, for example, and prevent, uh, and of course, like a, a you be used as a pre uh, tool uh, to avoid any quality failures, uh, which could save a lot of time, uh, as well as um, what the actual result could be in terms of uh, the finishing and the structural uh, aspect. So, from uh, the Protoss perspective, we, of course, it is uh, we we can say that. Uh, every part and every uh, feasibility of um, uh, each part to be made is looked really um, into as depth as possible. And we provide um, the feedback and the, the education in order not only to basically be able to uh, consult on just making the part, but how it could be better made, um, what are some other um, design aspects behind that, the manufacturability uh, point of view, uh, some improvements that could be made. So um, I would say the um, AI could be used um, fairly fast in order to further develop this. Okay, uh, so one of the one of the the uh, the uh, things that scored high on one of the challenges was lack of expertise. So are the engineers engineers graduates equipped for the new world of manufacturing? And we've got a couple of questions here from the floor uh, that kind of touch on those. How useful is it? Undergrad students have a good understanding of material properties and selection, an understanding of life cycle analysis versus more general design, teamwork, etc. And which, from your experience so far, is a key skill set currently missing from the engineering workforce when it comes to utilizing powder bed fusion for structural parts design and production? So, any any answers to that to those burning questions on skill sets and uh, equipping our new graduates and engineers? Yeah, um, yeah. Go go ahead, Tassos. Well, I think it's. The uh, second time, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, from from my point of view, I mean, it's it's skill sets wider than AM that we need. You know, we got alternative fuels, electrification, hydrogen topics. There's something that would be really interesting to get some people with some knowledge coming in um, uh, before they join us and learn it learn it with us. Um, on the AM front, I think they only skirt the you know they just do a periphery on on materials and they try and get. Um, it's a very generalist approach on the aerospace on on the aerospace curriculums. I think for um, it would be quite interesting because I think if we do go mainstream with this sort of technology, we'll need an awful lot of skills, and um, you know, quite quite high powered skills in this in this area, almost into the experts. Um, uh, so I think it is a is a gap. I don't know if you can do a specific specific training in AM at AM at the moment, but. We, we generally go for more of the the sort of cross the board generalist aerospace engineers when we're when we're recruiting. Um, I think there, there could be an opportunity to do something in a bit more detail. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I would I say I would say. Uh, sorry, sorry, Alex. Go. Uh, I was just going to say I, I I think there's a lot of focus on the um, design optimization and and build at the moment. Um, that there's there's maybe a two different angles to consider. What one would be um, considering the more sort of multifunctional aspects of the design. Um, so how you can make the most of the technology, considering it's part of the system of, of how it sits in the aircraft. Um, so uh, would there be you no know, structural thermal um, in, incorporating most features so you can weight optimize the part and get the most out of it. But the other is then 
um it, it's also how do you design it such that you can inspect it and finish it um understanding the process of the things that you know influence the the defects the surface finish um and and how do you how do you automate um the the, the process considering they get a good part out um such that you've got a rate capable um system there's there's some other aspects of the process that need to be considered and the focus is on can can we build it at the moment can we get the right material properties which is is to some extent where the focus should be but we also need developing the skills and capabilities such that when that gets cracked um the other things aren't aren't waiting years to be developed um otherwise again it's going to hinder getting the technology um commercialized at rate that's us and from my point of view, I would say these are really, really uh, good questions. And basically, these will drive a lot um, the future engineers. So basically, in my view, the core understanding of the materials and the material science, the metallurgy for metals generally is an absolute um, standard approach that should be looked at. Uh, and not only on the university and possibly on earlier years, uh, because uh, if we comment now on the additive manufacturing point of view, um, this was really um, r rapidly um, uh, came into everyone's mind. Uh, many engineers who were working with, um, let's say, more established processes um, came up with this new process. So basically, additive manufacturing could not be fully evolved if the, the core understanding of the materials uh, as one, the secondly, uh, and secondly, the, um, the design approach, because the design approach for uh, additive manufacturing is completely a new world. Uh, there are plenty of, of course, uh, software around the market, but most of the, the ones that are um, fully capable of producing um, parts from aerospace, let's say, in this case, uh, are really expensive. So in high investments, uh, either should be uh, made. And of course, we don't really have a lot of examples of, apart from some really um, straightforward um, applications, but more focus should be given on the, um, um, I don't know, maybe from the high school level, uh, on the design point of view and the material science. So these would define um, the skill set as well, because even now there are plenty of, um, let's say, um, we see it here in Protolabs that um, uh, when some parts fail, some fatigue tests, let's say, or uh, mechanical uh, tests, uh, even with, when uh, talking with um, fellow engineers or quality engineers, there is not a fully understanding why this has happened. And this doesn't really rely on the actual build of the actual printer itself, but it depends on how the material reacts after being subjected to an X, Y um, pressure, for example, or how it is built, how it is um, um, used um, to, yeah, to be complete as a, as a part. So basically, material science and design intent really key. Factors, which should start before university, in my view. Fantastic. OK, so we're, we're coming up to uh, to the end of this now. So I'm just going to come go around the panel for final thoughts uh, on on uh, maybe the survey or maybe predictions for the future. Um, you know, dis uh, additive manufacturing is dis uh, dis disruptor. What might be seen in the, in the future? What predictions have we got? Uh, what might the survey look like this, you know, 12 months from now? Uh, anyone like to start that? Final thoughts to finish um, off. Yeah, so, yeah, I really enjoyed reading the report. I think it's worth if, if people haven't read it to, to have a read because there's lots of different elements of it um, that I, I wholeheartedly agree with and we see as an industry as, as key points on the, uh, the resource ramp ups and the ability to ramp up production. So Airbus now have something like 6,000 aircraft after on the back order so we're on single aisle that is alone so tremendous position we need technologies that will help us to ramp up and maybe you know am is is one of those definitely when we get to the new aircraft we want to do that in a much a much shorter cycle whenever whenever that will be in the in the next 20 years or whatever 
Um, we want to be able to shorten that production cycle, development cycle from design to, to first aircraft. So I think AM will play a key part in enabling us to do that. So we do need those skill sets. Also, you know, let's not forget all these other technologies. So hydrogen is a whole new thing to us, fuel system. And yep. there's, there's huge opportunities for hydrogen in, in, the, in the propulsion storage and, uh, and distribution systems within that. But yeah, good, good, uh, good survey, and uh, good to be involved with this today. So thanks very much for inviting me. Tassos, what's your uh, your your, your sure. thoughts? Uh, yes, uh, I would say that uh, basically I was also um, surprised in a good way uh, with the survey because uh, the points were really accurate and very realistic. I would say so. Um, these could could show the way uh, moving forward and i would say in this case uh, that um the role of um digital manufacturers how um, important it will be in the future in the adaptation of added manufacturing and of course how it will help um, um the industry for example now we're talking about aerospace and companies like airbus because the collaboration between uh, digital manufacturers and um, certification bodies um, and, and, and generally uh, the supply chain. Uh, I believe this could be a good uh, drive moving forward in order to see some results and to uh, to see some of these points uh, to get moving in the right direction. Of course, 12 months might be um, quite soon, uh, but there are still uh, quite a few challenges, uh, but I believe by fully understanding uh, what is involved, uh, what needs to be done, uh, it will be much easier um, to move forward. Great. Uh, Alex, any uh, predictions I, from you? Yeah, I, I think as um, in line with things that um, have been said, that there'll be a drive towards things in terms of um, uh, automation to help with um, uh, the, the ramp up, um, but also making sort of businesses robust in terms of um, uh, recognizing the, the demographic um, in, in those organizations. Knowledge capture and retention is clearly going to be um, key to learn from the skilled workforce and, and um, drive that into future production, future aircraft. Um, but then it's, it's also the, the drive for net zero um, is, is going to be a major factor and part of that is going to be sustainable manufacturing not just the technologies flying on the aircraft but but how we um, design make um, and test them uh, and dealing with end of life I think will become a, a bigger and bigger focus over the coming years um, certainly we've seen from our uh, strategy and the latest update destination zero um, how much had changed over the last few years in the move towards um, net zero uh, it is a period of, of quite substantial change, and I can imagine there'll be quite a bit more um, uh, that will happen between now and the next survey. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that then. So with that, I'm going to have to uh, draw stumps uh, with that. So thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us, uh, everybody who's, uh, who's dialed in today. I think we'll all agree that was an absolutely fascinating insight into uh, aerospace manufacturing, additive manufacturing. AI, diversity, certification, uh, you name it. Uh, so a big thanks for our experts uh, to Colin, Alex, uh, Atasos, uh, and also a huge thanks as well to Proto Labs for um, sponsoring this survey and all this this, this webinar as well. Uh, so look look forward to uh, for a recording of this uh, of this webinar in your inboxes, and uh, also look out for the next Aero Society events that are coming. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.